All right, welcome to a special episode of a new show that is going to be a game study. Basically, we're taking the book club concept that a lot of podcasts are doing, and we're just going to play some of our favorite games and really dive into them, whether that be the the lore of the thing, how we feel about the actual gameplay, the development history, whether that's interesting or not. And so I have with me here Mr. Justin Wood. And this is something we've been kicking around for a while now, and it's starting to take shape, and I'm excited about it. Yeah, I think we've been kicking around the idea for a couple of months now, and mm-hmm. uh, I, I think it's I think it's a perfect way, a perfect title to start with, because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this was both of our first time playing through this like massively critically successful, or maybe not critic. Is it critically successful? Both critically and commercially. Oh, okay. Like, I think I, the last time I caught sales numbers on Nier, I wrote an article about it. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And I think that this particular game, and obviously you all know because of the title, we're talking about Nier Automata today. Yeah. Automata. I say Automata. Whatever. <laughs> I say Nier. You know, the 2B, <laughs> and then everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yep. That one. Yeah. Um, But generally, like, this game is really kind of fitting for this idea of the game study because this game is made for people who like video games. Like, it is, at its core, about video games, surprisingly enough. Yeah, this game will even ask you, do you think video games... What is it? Do you think video games are a joke? Right, or important, or worthwhile. Yes. Like, those are some of the last questions you get in the fabled ending E. Yeah. But so, gen- let's, uh, let's kick this off, Justin, with okay. just... What experience do you have with not only Nier, but also Drakengard, which plays into this? Yeah, um, so funnily enough, um, I was a huge fan of the original Drakengard. It was one of my, like, mainstay PS2 games. I think I, altogether, I probably put, like, 200 hours into that game. I would play it, like, over and over again. I had a, a buddy at the time. We used to just, like, that's what we would do is we'd hang out and Get drunk and play Drakengard. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like that's an adequate way to play that game. Because yes, it is. Yes. It is a slog. And then I, I don't think I ever actually played two. And I know Near itself is uh, attached to Drakengard three, if I'm not mistaken. I actually somewhere along the line. Yeah, I don't in one of the, the exact endings timeline. or something. Yeah. I actually uh, just recently picked up a copy of Drakengard three for the PS3. I have one of those. I've never yeah. played it. I, I played the I'm first level. I have that. <laughs> I played the first level and was like, well, I don't know if I like this. <laughs> um, it's different. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Drakengard, you know, it's there. Uh, and then kind of jumping forward to Nier, uh, Nier, Stalt, Replicant, the Xbox. Just version. Nier in America. Yeah. Uh, Nier, man, I picked it up when it first came out because mm. I just, I remember Justin McElroy talking about this, this weird ass game that had like, a busted ass fishing mechanic in it. And I was like, okay, I'll try it out. I'm like, this was kind of in the, in my stage of like a video game comes out. I don't care. I have to buy it just to play mm-hmm. it. And I was kind of, I had time <laughs> and this is where I could play everything I want to do. And a million games weren't coming out all at once. Um, and I think I played about, I think maybe six hours. I really didn't get that too far into it. And then I just kind of dropped it because it got right. repetitive. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ah, I don't really want to do this. And then Nier Automata came out, and then I think I played up until the and up until you started playing as Nine S, and mm, then Nine okay. S's gameplay didn't really click with me at the time, so I bounced off. That's again when it first came out, and then just recently when we kind of figured out our recording date and everything, I it was the first time I've actually picked it up since launch. Mm-hmm. So, what about yourself? So I always heard of Drakengard specifically because okay. I watched a lot of G4 as a youngin, and you know that has all sorts of different things going on. I really yep. like Code Monkeys. I watched X Play, uh, for better or worse, you know. Um, but Drakengard, for whatever reason, like I saw the cutscenes for it. I was really into fantasy generally. All the Final Fantasies appeal to me. So you throw a big dragon and have some like yep. <laughs> blood splatter effects, and I'm probably in even today. And so I heard about it, and I just kind of followed it. And when I got to college, I had a friend who we talked about RPGs and stuff all the time. 
And so me and Tyler got onto the discussion of, like, weird things we liked that most people don't like. And so he talked about, like, Krudelka and Shadow Hearts and Drakengard specifically. And he's like, dude, Drakengard's the darkest game I've ever played. And so he started explaining the lore to me, which is extremely messed up. And, uh, yeah, like, I never paid full of all the sorts lore. of stuff. <laughs> and really cool cutscenes and arbitrary ways to get this footage. And it's just... It's so much more than what it looks like it is. And that's what always amazed me about it. And so he loved Nier. He's like, oh, Nier's great. I spent a lot of time on it. I never played it. Um, but when Automata came out, I think I was working at a GameStop at the time. And all of my, like, I was getting into games media. All of the critics and stuff that I followed were like, this is the game if you like video games. Yeah. And so I bought it. Played up to the point, probably about where you are, where it switched over to... Or maybe I beat it once or something. Yeah. And I was like, this is fine. A couple years later, I get a little farther. I get to A2, okay. the third character that you play as. And at that point, I'm like, I think I've seen enough. Yeah. And so I left it, knowing that there's like a big ending that's a big deal. And so for this, I was like, I want to finish it. And so not only did I finish it, but I also... I Over the years, I pick up random video game books... Just because anything with Square Enix is label on it. <laughs> Listen, I I'm, a, I'm, I'm a shill for Square Enix, so I understand. Yes. <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't like about them, but oh, by God, there's I, a lot but... more positive than negative <laughs> yeah. for me. <laughs> either do I, but I am a Square apologist. <laughs> yes, I've always been a Final Fantasy fan. Any yeah. of their weird stuff I'll pick up. Like if there's a game that they really, like I've never played Vagrant Story. I would love to play Vagrant Story. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's how I got into like Nier. and once I got into Nier Automata, I was like, man, this is really cool, and I get why people like this. And so I wanted to finish it. I picked up a couple, uh, like publications that I found. So one of them's a short story collection, and I read at least the first story and most of the second story. And I'll talk about this once we get into kind of like my main point of why this game is cool and interesting. But um, I also watched the the anime adaptation up to okay. what is available. So the first like five episodes or so. And that's a really solid anime adaptation for just the general plot line of Nier. But you don't get that like game dev component that makes Nier Automata so special. So so I do have a question then. Does it like, I've only watched, so I've only watched the first episode. Yeah. Um, does it divert at all plot wise or anything? Or is it just like? Not yet. Okay. Um, as far as I can tell, it's just a very good like condensing of the okay. plot of so far just to be's first story. Okay. So you, there's a great scene where Adam and Eve show up. It's very well animated. Um, there's shots that look like they're ripped straight out of the game. So that, that angle where it's just the two guys at the table and yeah. they slowly get more humanity. So like the first time you see them, they're in their underwear and he's like, why do we have to wear underwear? This is stupid. <laughs> And then the other Adam's like, no, listen, you got to like, we got to learn how to be humans. You got to read this stuff. We got to clothe ourselves. And so the next time you see them, they're wearing more clothes. And this is just one stupid little thing, <laughs> like literally a, a five minute scene or something, maybe less. Like sometimes in near it's just dialogue that has yeah. all these layers and connotations and things that you can infer from it. And so this the game was carefully crafted in a way that like is a hundred percent up to interpretation, and that's why I think it's such a fitting start for this show because we're at the end of the day we're video game academics. Oh yeah, oh, that's a weird way to put it, but yeah, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, I mean it. Yep, <laughs> that's what we're doing, man. We're yeah, taking yeah. in media and we're giving the old critical element, and you know. But yeah, so if you're basically. Before we even get into the discussion about what Nier Automata is, if you want to know why people like it and want to get the general themes and characters, the anime is a great place to start, in my opinion, and might actually help your playthrough of the PS4 game. Or P you can also play it on PS5, but it's a MP great MPC. like preface. <laughs> True. Yes, that's where I played it. <laughs> oh right, I think it's on Xbox now too. Actually, yeah, I think it was on like Game Pass for a while, so it's got to it's yeah. got to be on there. But yeah, yeah, I mean it's. Man, there's so much. There's so much to talk about near wise. Uh, man, there's a lot of like. It, it's weird. Like I've, it's been a very long time since I've played a game that has like such high expectations, but mm -hmm. that acts almost as like baggage, because people have been talking about this game for years. Specifically, oh, yeah. the one critic that comes to mind every time I think about uh, near is Chris Plant. Mm -hmm. He talks about near like all the time. Still. 
so for me it's like i i suffer that issue where it's like if somebody talks about stuff i'm immediately like yes let's do it come on it's going to be amazing if yep. they're talking about it i'm immediately on the hype train so if i can go from like zero expectations to somebody talking about it like one or two times and i'm like okay i'm i'm peak yep. hype like let's get into this let's do it so it's, it was weird kind of going into this game with a lot of hype mm -hmm. but also kind of expecting it to have like baggage because it's impossible to go into a thing that's been talked about so highly and like highly regarded right. for years and years and years and years and years and try to like still have that it's it's almost it's like, like, a weird, the, like you almost miss the magic moment right yes. of not knowing yeah it's, especially like so the ending i'm not gonna say mm -hmm. what it is yet but specifically like i knew the gimmick going into it partially sure. i didn't know mm -hmm. the whole like gameplay element of it but i knew that there was gameplay there and like what the kind of deal was the basically. expectation yeah. yeah so that i think if i did not know that and if it hadn't been talked about so many times i think that would have been a lot more magical but mm -hmm. because of what it was i was when i got to it i was like oh, okay this is what everybody was talking about it's very similar to another game from this era undertale which also has some very yes. unique to video games at the time you kind of have to go into it not knowing to really get the fullest effect yes. out of it yeah and yeah, because I remember even, like, I think I watched, like, a Let's Play of, like, the first hour and was like, oh, right. well, I really wish I didn't watch that mm -hmm. because now going into it, I know, like, okay, I can't do this or else. I don't want to ruin other games for people. I so. the first run uh, without knowing anything because I, like, I picked it up because so many people were saying you need to get this. And so I grabbed it on, you know, GameStop or whatever. And Oh, see, so yeah, I the thing with me is I immediately knew. So I was like, okay, I have to, I have to do a pacifist. That's... Oh, right. Yeah, for Undertale. Yeah. yeah. Oh, when it came to Undertale, like, my sister's really into it, and she's like, you specifically need to play this way if you want to get, like, if you want to do everything in the most effective way to see everything, because I know that's what you want to do. Yeah. And I'm like, great. And so we, like, we played, I think, half of it and, you know, lost interest or whatever. So I've never finished Undertale. That might be a game for this series, honestly. I can tell you that I eventually stopped doing a pacifist run, got enough money to, like, buy all of the trophies in like an in-game store and was like oh i got the platinum so i'm never gonna finish this game now and <laughs> put it down so i've never gotten a platinum really Un um, until I until technically yesterday my or no earlier this week my uh my partner is really into the new lego star wars she and she was playing on my profile she got the platinum for that <laughs> she got the platinum that's oh my, my first God. platinum i one uh, that she got i got that game for my son because he's obsessed with lego and obsessed mm -hmm. with star wars he plays that like every day and I don't think he's anywhere close, but he's always like, Oh, I'm like 20% done. I'm just going to restart it. I was like, oh, yep. don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, she played through it in like a weekend and then was like, I want a hundred percent this not right. realizing that it was just this massive list of like things to do and a bunch of bullshit to deal with. But she did it as Lego games ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some weird like you gotta kind of finagle the game to make it pop the thing for of you of course of course and some of the flying missions were just nonsense and so yeah she's like, i those are the missions that i had to do for my son <laughs> yep, these are the yeah. ones i had to do for Gina. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so that was the first time i ever like platinum the game i like 100 okay. in games every now and again uh the shante series typically mm -hmm. are a very easy to manage 100 percent that takes about 10 hours and so i've i've been 100 percenting those usually as they come out See, I think I only have maybe I keep up uh, like a poll or like a journal of them, I guess. I don't know how you yeah. would say that on Twitter sure. is like I just post it every time. It's in like this pin this like thread pinned thread. Sorry. Sure. Mm -hmm. I actually learned the other day that I might be dyslexic too, so that's been interesting. I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah. And it, it makes like when I try to talk normally it sounds weird, but when I mix words up it sounds perfectly fine to me. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. But I, I keep this thread going of all the platinums i've got and i made sure that it's only games i like i enjoy i really enjoy i think my first one was like control okay I've, that's an amazing game anyways near <laughs> so yeah control's another game in this like 2010s era that's deserve like gets away with more than what it appears and i think yes. that's the strength of near there is going back to control for a second <laughs> uh -huh. there is one part in control that I think deserves everybody's attention, but you kind of have to play through it to get to that moment to have 
the, like the impact of it, the right? impact that you need. You can't just like watch uh-huh. that part. Have you played Control? I've played the first hour like okay, six I times. I won't. T- I won't say what it is, but there is a moment. So the podcast I recorded later. <laughs> oh sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Here's Johnny uh, podcast. Yeah, which yeah. Is how we became friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go listen um, to that. He was like, I told him ahead of time. I was like, listen, there's this part that is fantastic. I'm not going to tell you anything. I just want to let you know. Mm-hmm. And I felt bad because I was like, oh man, I'm the now I'm the one who's like overhyping this moment. And he texted me literally the second it happened. He was like, no, you were completely right. That was like one of the best things. I've That was like one of the best. Is that in the core in the game. game or one of the DLCs? Oh, it's in the core game. Ooh, okay. I it's own like this. I just, right because the, the, the way they did the update for PS5 around the time I wanted to play it, I was like, yeah. man, I'd rather get the like, so the fancy 4K version or whatever. Do If you do the PS5 version, I think it's like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if it's called the definitive edition. I don't remember what they called it. But they actually have like toggles in it where you can just like turn God mode on and just like wreck shop, and it doesn't affect trophies or anything. If if that's important, good but for yeah, them. It, yeah, mm-hmm. and it it's amazing. They have like a lot. I've noticed a lot of companies are obviously adding in like a a lot more accessibility features. Yeah, like accessibility features, even if it is like simple. Mm-hmm. You know, to enemies take more damage, you take less damage, god mode, like all this. Like, Yeah, the simple inclusion of a god mode would just immediately help a lot of people, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, so actually, this kind of works with Nier. Um, mm-hmm. I played, the the way I played this game is because I am not as dexterous as I used to be. <laughs> right. No, I'm not either. Um, especially with like when it comes to bullet hells, like I, my mind can't wrap like i can't wrap my mind around a bullet hell really so Mm -hmm. i played with like all my auto chips on and uh i don't know i just i I felt like it helped the flow of game really well but i definitely did notice some like downturns to that um so here's an interesting thought because this debate is actively happening where final fantasy 16 supposedly reportedly i don't know we don't know yet Mm-hmm. Um, has features similar to Nier where a lot of the accessibility things like one-button combos are a thing that you equip and take up an accessory slot. Yeah, and you can only have, like, three of them, I think is what I heard. Whatever, yeah. But regardless, the fact that they, like, there's an accessibility option that then makes your character less effective. That idea exists in Nier. Yeah, it's been to around To a lesser for... extent, maybe, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to see that even back in... Oh my god! I I just played this game. I can't remember. Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. That these were like this was in the it was in the initial release. Like they kind of had these. Twenty seventeen. Okay, twenty seventeen. Yeah, twenty fourteen. Twenty seventeen. <laughs> yeah. It's like five or six years old at this point. Yeah. Wow. Oh man. Wow. Um. It, it's interesting to see that they kind of had this stuff figured out, and I think they did. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, they could. There is more they could do accessibility wise, but it's it's interesting that you see, kind of the beginnings of the like big accessibility push in games even back then because mm-hmm. even though you have to like equip these auto slots to like auto shoot auto heal auto pick up items auto dodge all that stuff it doesn't like it, it takes up i believe it's just like one slot each and i think you have Usually. like 50 mm-hmm. of them or something like that right. and i think all the auto things take up maybe 10 yeah um auto pick up item so oh, I, whenever I sat down to play it for this for this show, uh, I really wanted to dive into the combat and figure mm-hmm. out like how items worked and how the chips worked and all that type of stuff. And auto pick up item was my favorite thing because it's oh you can just like run by and it's just like yeah because yep. I I will say one of the one of my like it's a huge pet peeve of mine is in a game like this. Mm-hmm. And any like loot, I wouldn't. I guess this isn't really like a loot game, but like in any like loot based game or game where you're just in general picking up items all the time, they need to have an auto pickup. Having to walk over and like individually pick up items is a pain in the ass. Get um, that item pickup as fast as you can, as far yeah. as I'm concerned, when starting this game, and it it kind of helps to take the time to figure out the system in yes, your first absolutely. playthrough. Yeah. Because then the subsequent playthroughs will make way more sense. Yeah, like, uh, so I will say going through this now, like, I, f- I finished it, like, maybe an hour before we sat down here. I'm excited to kind of, like, go back into it and maybe turn those off to see, like, how I do fare in the combat. Because, like, did you did you have any of, like, the auto, like, did you have, like, all of the auto combats on or no? 
No, I didn't mess with the auto combat as much. Sometimes I would turn on the auto shooting. Oh yeah, my finger hurt after a while, so I just I turned like literally I turned auto dodge. I turned auto. I I did. I had to do like the sword attacks mm-hmm. and like the hacking, but it also like kind of <laughs> it made it very easy because <laughs> um, you just like you're flipping around the screen and I can yeah. just literally put the controller down. Yeah, the game plays itself at that point. Yeah, which was like, it was interesting because it also kind of made me feel like I was a badass, even though I wasn't really doing anything. Mm -hmm. This is a great jumping off point um, because you were in that moment, you were the programmer of uh, 9S. Yeah, I programmed these people, yes. You programmed an Android. Mm -hmm. In a way, you are that being's master slash creator which comes into play of the bigger themes in Near Automata. Let's talk about lore. Here we go. Oh, oh boy. This is where I'm going to get lost because... <laughs> That's the best <laughs> part. <laughs> get lost with us today. Uh, Near Automata is a game primarily about the struggle between machines and androids. Androids being the more human-looking characters. Yes. But underneath their artificial skin, they are robots. And they, and they are set out, the androids are set out to basically help humanity survive. Their whole thing is they are protecting humanity mm-hmm. who has fled to the moon. So uh, or either way, uh, the general conflict is machines versus androids. These machines were brought to the planet by aliens, and that's all they call them, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell. There's probably a lore piece somewhere. But um, so th- this is the setup of the entire thing, right? Uh, The androids and the machines fight indefinitely for, like, hundreds of thousands of years. And so the androids operate out of the moon. They protect the humans at a different part of the moon base that they don't they don't interact with humans or nothing they work yeah. kind of a, as a as an organization dictating the androids to yeah. go and try to get rid of the machines or whatever and so generally it's two factions with the sole goal of wiping out the other faction machines on the other hand they have the advantage of being self-evolving beings yes. their whole mechanical purpose is they can take in parts and rebuild themselves and add on different things and generally just get stronger and stronger to the point that the first kind of like antagonist we meet looks like an android but is a machine and both of that android and both that machine adam and eve and the uh the androids that we see are very human looking right yes absolutely so here's the crux eventually and it's time for spoilers because here we go (laughs) eventually you find out the aliens are dead they're yeah. they're bodied and their ships are left in them in like a graveyard in the moon and the humans are presumably dead as well. They're not there. The entire organization is operating as a front. Yorha is a lie, and all of the things that you have been doing have just been there to perpetuate the general idea left behind by humanity. This is a godless world. I mean, it's really like <laughs> this is kind of where I sided with like nine S at the beginning or at the mm-hmm. ending, sorry. When he's like, don't you see, like, none of it matters. Because really, like, right. when you look back on this game as a whole, like, if you really think about it, like, obviously it was fun and, you know, you enjoyed the stories mm-hmm. along the way, but, like, none of it mattered. Like, really, mm-hmm. like, the struggle that 2B goes through and 9S and even A2, like, it's, like, Pascal even, like, none of it matters. It really there does is not matter. a heavy nihilist angle to this entire mm-hmm. thing, and 9S as a character kind of represents that. This is where things really kind of take a turn, too, is not just the the chronological series of events in Nier Automata are fascinating. But then you get into the second layer where you have characters like Pascal. You have yeah. the game opening on basically a paraphrase of Friedrich Nietzsche. Like there's a lot of ph- philosophy like baked into this thing. Yeah, <laughs> highly recommend the uh, the Wisecrack video that's about the philo- like they, they point out. You know, it comes from this guy. It comes from this person. Yeah, and it, what, what's interesting about it, too, is like, so I have been on record multiple times in multiple places saying I'm not a huge fan of the way that Dark Souls speaks its lore. It's basically mm-hmm. like, I don't like having to, like, drill down on the items and all this stuff. Sure. Which is partially interesting because, like, each weapon in Nier has a story that you unlock through, like, upgrading it, mm-hmm. which I don't think I ever fully upgraded a weapon. I was always missing, like, one key component. Yeah, I might have, because I think they upgrade to four, and I think I got most of mine to three. Yeah, like, I, I had the majority of mine to three, but I, man, did I ever have one to four? I think I might have, like, one that mm-hmm. had, like, all the way to four, but Nier has a different 
I wouldn't even say an issue, but like a more interesting approach where it's just like at some points in time, it will seem like they are just like throwing story at you. And Mm -hmm. like that doesn't at the time seem like it really like, like it seems like you're taking, you're having to take it a lot. And so a lot of it is like hard to kind of like grab because so much is being thrown at you. It's interesting to play a game and like go, oh, you know what? I I am ready to sit down for like six hours and watch some YouTubers and like yep. drill down on this. And that's just going to be my week is just like listening to people talk about the, the lore and story and like what really matters in near. The in-game story is what you make of it. And ultimately, that's kind of the whole point that they're really like trying to drive home is what's important to you when you play a game? Is it the fact that you got to the end, saw mm-hmm. the credits, saw the heroes win? Was it the journey that you took? Was it helping out somebody? This entire game is structured in a way with ending E to incite actual empathy in you, the player, where you give up your entire save file to help out another person in the final moments where you play a bullet hell against the credits of the game. And it's it's hard. It's near impossible. I don't think you can beat it without help because I got really far. <laughs> I was at this for like 30 minutes straight and I'm finally I like, like died. I think I was like, I was probably about halfway through. And then I was like, Man, I can't like, <laughs> I can't do this. Like I legitimately felt like I'm not going to be able to do this because mm-hmm. I, I didn't realize. So going into it, I knew that I didn't know it was going to be a bullet help. Mm-hmm. And I knew people were going to come and help you if you needed it. Question mark. Right. And I knew that at some point in time, he would ask you if you want to delete your save. Mm-hmm. And that was like a big, like, oh, inspiring moment at the time. So going through it, I was very, like, I was surprised that it was a bullet hell. I guess not really surprised, but I was like, okay, yes, this is, like, you know, happening. And then I died the first time halfway through. And I was like, I mean, I can't do this again. Like, I just played yeah. this for, like, 10 minutes. I don't want to do it again. Mm-hmm. And then that's when it kind of starts asking you all these, like... The trick questions. goes on a little long, for, in my opinion, and that's yes. generally my like main critique about Nier, is when it's got a really good idea, sometimes it just goes a little too long. Um, and, and if you kind of want to look, look back at that, I I think that is like, we get inklings of that early on when we mm-hmm. have to play through the story again as 9S. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Personally, that was like a really, a really big turning point for me. That is where I definitely started to like waver a little bit, also because I wasn't a huge fan of like the... The hacking minigame. Right. That's I think that's the issue is it feels less cool compared to 2B's gameplay. Yes, absolutely. Because like with even with 9S, you still have like your main attack. That's like cool, mm-hmm. but he's not as like agile or I mean, he isn't like mm-hmm. a, a, ba- a, you know, a B unit, a battle unit or whatever. But having to like I, if they had kind of so after you beat the story as 2B, you kind of go back and you kind of have to restart it basically as 9S. It, it is From definitely his not perspective. Yeah, it's not as long, but it definitely is quite long. I think if they had just maybe found a way to maybe tell you the important bits without you having to play through the entire game again, and then kind of like put you in his shoes for maybe even the last third would have been a lot easier because I, I find just like, and this could be like the quote unquote like gamer side of me, but I'm like, okay, I've done this. I don't want to do it right. Again. I've, I think I that's this. the weakness of the the very well done intro is that you end up playing that intro like eight times or something, yeah. and it's like okay, you know, and, there's and, no way to, to your skip point, this. Like the first time you play it, it's it's awesome. Like it's oh, like, it's super cool. But again, <laughs> the second time, the third time, the yeah. fourth, it's like okay, mm-hmm. I'm ready for it to kind of move on. And so that feeling the, is worse than the first near. So it's streamlined a little bit for okay. this game. I haven't gone for that far near, so maybe I won't. <laughs> But it, I know, like, you have to like almost speed run sections in the first uh, near to see. Get and I, those I extra hear playthroughs. near. I don't remember what the re-release version is called. It's like one replicant, point, whatever. Um, you have to collect all the weapons too to get the new ending, which is just like, no, nah, I'm not. Yeah, gonna do that. there, there's to get the very to get. I think ending D, you have to get all the weapons, and it's not that big of a deal, but it is like it took me time. I really, in, I wrote a review about Near Replicant. I liked yeah. it surprisingly a lot more than I expected. And I think it's because there's a difference between Near and Near Automata in the fact that Near makes you adore that main cast. You're building up the found family. You're getting really close to these characters. You see each and every one of them progress. You don't necessarily get that in Near Automata. 
which is why I like the anime right now, because they're showing off characters that you wouldn't necessarily get development for as much. Somebody like Jackass or the uh, or Lily or some of the resistance members like okay, you get yeah, more of who they are. Yeah, because I feel like that's like near Automata has its like main cast, right? It's got like mm-hmm. the, the the Yorha units and Pascal. Some of the machine. Yeah, yeah I some... like Pascal personally. I know. I agree. Uh, I do too. The dancer boss. There's Adam and Eve who are interesting. Yeah, but I, I feel like those characters themselves don't. Well, Adam and Eve is a difference, right? I, I think they do get it really well flushed mm-hmm. out. But like the dancer boss, for example, I think artistically that is an amazing fight. Oh, yeah. I would have loved to have gotten like some more like story kind of leading into it. Like right. you're hearing about this bot who's, um, you know, I don't know, a dancer or whatever. And it's kind of like building up, building up. And then you finally face her. Right. Um, it is could... weird to, to switch that. Like you do the boss. And then I think on the second or third play, you get the backstory. And yes. so that's why like playing near subsequent times outside of just doing endings A through E. Like if you sit down and play near again after playing it all the way through, in six months yeah it's gonna feel completely different so uh, if okay i wasn't sure if i was gonna bring this up but okay i have to talk about something that makes it so this episode can't come out uh okay that's fine. so in this preview build i played for dead island 2 <laughs> yeah um there's this section where it's like first of all it's dead island so i wasn't expecting much i'm gonna be <laughs> i mean i even told the developer this when i interviewed them i was like listen i went into this and i thought it was gonna be garbage mm-hmm. um and he respected it. He was like, okay. And I, you know, I told him how I felt about it, which was, by the way, that game is like somehow fucking amazing. There's this point where you go into this like hotel and it's like mm. all done up. Like it's supposed to be like a wedding. And you keep hearing about how this, this bride was like a real bridezilla. And like you're finding all these notes and it's, and it's just like simple things like, oh, I, I, I can't remember her name now, but let's say it's like, uh, I'm looking around my room trying to find it. Let's say her name was 2B. I don't know. Cause we're talking about it oh man 2b was like such a bitch today blah, 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 you know right, right and then yeah. like you hear you find notes from like the groom's party and like the groomsmen's rooms like talking about her and like you find like audio notes and then it's just like this it doesn't even have to be like substantial really because then you finally find her and she's a zombie and she's like this boss who's like she's like this giant ripped bride who's kicking ass but i i found the like the the really like inconsequential but slow build to like I, I I don't know. I I find that does a lot, specifically mm-hmm. in games, like in like action oriented games. Like I'm trying to think of um The Witch and Banjo Kazooie is yeah, a pretty exactly. common one. Mm-hmm. Like you don't it doesn't need to be like an intricate story told to you up front, but I, I definitely think that like hearing specifically like this this really boils down to me for down or to me, yeah, uh, the amusement park level itself. Because I think otherwise, yeah. like, the bosses kind of make sense that there's not, like, a lot of story to them. Like, specifically, um, like, the, I think it's, like, a meteor crash site. I don't remember exactly where, like, mm-hmm. all the robots are, like, having sex the second time you play through. Yeah, that's a really, like, <laughs> that scene disturbs me. And it's <laughs> yep. really effective. Yep. And that you do get flavors of that in uh, the anime. Oh, oh. <laughs> Because okay, ultimately, the machines are trying to evolve. They're trying yeah. to get to the humans, or at least the aliens that built them, which could maybe be humans. The one that you see kind of looks like an alien from yeah. uh, Metal Slug. But, but like, so when you fight the boss down there, mm-hmm. it, I think it it's it suits it perfectly well that there's no build up to it, right? Because it's just kind of right. like you're it's in like a this mass, like right. Yeah, it's a mass, and even when you're out in the desert, I believe there's like a snake or something. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just kind of like, oh, kind of like a, a, an, a robotic monster that just kind of like shows up. Right. Whereas the amusement park, for being such like a standout section to me personally, specifically with like the music, because I, I got to tell you, the music in Nier is like phenomenal. It um, is really, really good. There are like few, well, I don't want to say that because I was going to say there's few video games that I listen to. That's not true. I have Final Fantasy music playlists like rota- mm-hmm. on rotation specifically after after theater rhythm but there are a lot of action oriented games i guess mm-hmm. that i find the noise kind of gets drowned out in the background whereas like near makes it a point to like put really like push it forward and i think it's it's really well in the the um amusement park because it's, you know it's, it sounds like a carnival is really like a, a mm-hmm. party and a carnival is happening and i think it's like this really interesting possibly the most like 
uh, the area that most players are going to see, it's just, I wish there was like a little inkling of like, it's potential. It's like overlord kind of, because this dancer is like the leader of the robots in that area. If I'm remembering correctly, I could be completely. So her whole story is she wants to be beautiful for another character, the character with the top hat, the other oh. robot. And oh, so her whole man. thing is building herself up to to her image of beauty based on what she studied of humanity through the various, like, you know, ruins and books and stuff. And so the reason that whole thing is messed up is because eventually she figures out that the androids are more beautiful than she will ever be. And so she uses their corpses to create the whole monstrosity. Yeah. Um. See, I, and I think that that is, it's not a lot of story mm-hmm. for that character, but I think it's like, it's just enough. And I would have loved to have gotten that flavor text before seeing her the first time. And then maybe getting like a little extra the second time, but having like some context to like, what the hell is going on? Cause that is something I found myself saying a lot in near is like, like what is going on? What is happening? In a way, that feels like a strength of me. And yeah, the reason no, I say yes, this is absolutely. because there's so many things that you can choose to dive into. And that's what yeah. I've discovered with this. Like, the one short story I read, um, which funnily enough, the book is called Short Story Long. Uh, oh, but okay. the first <laughs> short story is about, like, the machines who, like, they're they're a hive mind. There's one particular machine that's kind of like a Prometheus-style character. Okay. And he builds himself up to be this giant monstrosity. And then he launches himself at the moon to try to kill god basically (laughs) of course and so the whole short story is really like cool and full of neat imagery and all this like well-constructed sentences and stuff but um i like the fact that there's so many things if you go searching for them okay like near is really what you make of it right like yes you can play near and be like yep hot anime chicks fight each other and then some hacking Listen, happens and then we kill a robot i will never forget the controversy around like you have to look up her skirt to get a trophy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that that didn't age as well. But I love Yokotaru because he's just a weird little guy. And oh, he, that he whole just... team supporting his brain crazy ideas. Yeah, well, is that's just the thing. Incredible. It's like he loves his projects. He has a lot of passion behind his projects. And mm-hmm. I think that that really comes out. You know, even though I don't agree with like some of the the luring, luring I guess you could say, of Nier. Mm-hmm. I, I, I overall, I think it's a great experience. I mean, even in the story, because I find myself specific, specifically this like past like year, I am incredibly swamped with video games. That's of course, yeah. you know, my own problem, <laughs> you know, that's, Oh, woe, woe is me. But I, so I find myself like, I don't have a lot of like time for, okay. I got to look into backgrounds. I got to mm-hmm. like yep. r- really dive deep into this lore. But I, 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 I think what, near really deserves praise for is that it has kind of like two facets of this story is like you can take it on its base level and you will still get like a complete it's still story. fun yeah. yeah it's still fun you'll still get a complete story you can get mm-hmm. a complete story if you stop after playing as 2b that's a thing too if you choose to just quit after 2b's ending it's still an ending and i mean honestly same with 9s because at mm-hmm. the end of 9s is when a2 a comes in and kills 2b but like hey guess what that's like a character ending, like boom, right there. And yep. I, I think it really deserves praise for you can take this as deep as you want. You can mm-hmm. play it just for the game. It kind of shows you on its face and you will have a complete, you will have a complete like encapsulated experience no matter how far you take it. Or you can kind of go that other route of really diving in and like giving yourself into the lore that like, mm-hmm. I mean, there's just like pages and pages of it and even with the side quests, those like every side quest you do adds like a little bit more lore to like that kind of side of stuff. Like, cause I know for the first half of the game, third, I'm just going to break it up into thirds, even though I know it's not equal. Sure. Yeah. For the first third of the game, while I was playing as 2B, I tried to do as all, as many of the side quests as I could. But then mm-hmm. as soon as it switched over to 9S, I was like, okay, I'm not playing through yeah, the I'm side just quests again. Straight run it and yeah. get 9S done and over with was yeah. kind of my whole strategy. And then by, the, by that time, I was like, okay, well, I'm 2B or I'm 2A2 now. Mm-hmm. well i already missed half the side quests so i'm just gonna whatever i'm just gonna skip them um, so you do get a chapter select which is handy for somebody like me who is like no you're not deleting my save i want to go look at stuff so i i would fire up like bits and pieces of the story jump immediately in all of your weapons and levels and stuff transfer over well so they would just around. they would if i didn't delete my save to help somebody well, yeah. else yeah look at you i know right? for humanity 
<laughs> or humanity, right? Yeah, no, I, and that is like again to like man, the creators of this game. Um <laughs> they had a vision, man. They had I'm a vision. You. And I always say it takes a lot of guts to put in a thing at the very end of your game saying, delete your save. That is all they're asking. Like, delete your save. They ask you like four or five times if you want to do it. And then that's it. It makes you watch as it slowly deletes all your items out of your inventory, all your one. weapons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought about like turning it off and trying to like go back, but I was like, no, I got it. I, I made my choice. I have to see it through to the end. I take, yep. I think it takes a lot of guts to do that. And I think like they pull it off in such a perfect way. Yeah. It's the type of game that sticks with you. Like, yes. Truthfully. Even when I hadn't come close to beating about it, I heard all the discussion about it. You see the character everywhere. It's a very well-designed character. People yeah. love cosplaying 2B. Uh, Yokotaro loves that people love to cosplay 2B, <laughs> yeah. um, based <laughs> yep. on the interviews and stuff. Um, another interesting fact about the the whole trick, right? The whole deleting your save, like, that's not smoke and mirrors, apparently. There is a server that houses people's names and data that the game pulls from. So when the game first came out, and this is how we discovered the like secret way to get the final ending, is there's a there's a cheat code, like a developer oh. back door that'll warp you immediately to the end. And so when the game came out, the developers had to play that so that somebody who beat the game and got that far would have, would have and people. wouldn't be alone. And so I think just that idea too. Interesting. Like, there's that is such really a, interesting. Yeah, it's a game about empathy, man. Well, and, like, and how I know, did they like, do that? So I don't know. Did you read any of the messages? Like as as you mm-hmm. died, did you read any of the messages? So like you get to like pick your message. They're constructed based on predetermined chunks. Yes. Yeah, so like I think mine was like it was hard for me to like, keep you trying, know stay strong, you know, stay strong, yeah. and I'm always with you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that like I saw those messages and I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever, who cares. And then, like, getting to pick it at the end, that was kind of the moment for me. I was like, oh, like, somebody went through the thought and care to, like, because I, that's, that's what I did. I, I, like, sat there for five or ten minutes. I was like, man, what do I put? Like, what do I think will, like, stand it to somebody mm-hmm. as they're, like, on their last legs of the game, like, getting beaten down because this is, like, impossible. It forces you to be frustrated. Yes, absolutely. And, like, kind of going back to it, I, I definitely do think it goes on a little too long. Yeah, I think so, too. But it's it's it it's also such like a it's worth it like mm-hmm. it, it's it's so infuriating in the worst way. But then in the end, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I enjoyed that though. Like it was still good. Like I still had a lot of fun. And at the end of the day, it incites a emotional response in you. Like it's really hard for anybody who's like even remotely into gaming, right, to play through that organically and not feel something. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Oh, man, I just, I wish, I'm a little salty that I deleted my save only because I would like to go back and, like, clean some stuff up, psychos right. wise but I... Yeah, play through that, that like, three-hour <laughs> intro again, man. <laughs> oh, man. But to its credit, you say something like that, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's going to suck, but I would do it. I like, would I, do I would it. definitely, like, if I had, like, my next free time, I'll probably just, like, start casually, slowly playing again because it's it keeps itself fresh by like kind of having those restarts in it. Mm-hmm. And even though I didn't enjoy like the, the physical gameplay of it, there was still something a little refreshing about kind of like seeing the other character's perspective. And I think if I slow played that, like got to the ending of two B's like two B's ending and went, okay, I'll put this down for three months, come back to it and just play uh nine S's. I, th- I think it would, I think to its credit, I think it would, I'd be able to, because it's like a whole new fresh, gameplay idea and they mm-hmm. kind of slowly roll you into that as well um yeah i don't i, don't, I, I can't actually wait really for the next one time. yeah it's dude so this time around because i had played near mm-hmm. replicant so recently there was a moment in near automata where i was just wandering through the desert and i found like a rock structure that was emil the like the funny head that you yeah. uh yoko wears all the time that's a character in the first game that head was just like everywhere in some random ass corner of the desert. Cause I'm like, well, I wonder what's out here. So I just started like running around. Right. And I found an oasis I didn't find before with a, oh, I found that oasis, like, yeah. 
Yeah, she like gives you some stuff and that sort of thing. But I, I ended up at this thing and it was just this like these monuments to a character. And you eventually find out that like he's one of the few characters that ha his his existence and consciousness has carried over into this like far flung future. He doesn't quite remember what's going on, but he's still alive. Yeah. Mm. So do you think there will be another near? Absolutely. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. It's making far too much money. The yeah. fact that a mobile game exists and it's a gotcha, so it's probably making money hand over fist. Without a doubt, there will be another near title. If it's not near, it will absolutely be in this universe. I, I, I hope it's just as magical because like mm -hmm. there even though I didn't play through all the way of near just near. I'm just yeah, you're right. You know what? I'm just gonna call it near. Um mm -hmm. there's a moment in near Auto automata where you get to the library that is like a, a staple. Yep in near and it was just mm -hmm. like man i haven't even finished this game but like somehow it's like having this emotional pull of me like oh man i'm like standing here i can't believe it yep and playing near is like somehow being in the in every space i ever like loved and existed in in the ps2 jrpg era all at once yes it's yeah. bizarre yeah it's i near as a series is very special i think um mm -hmm. I, I i definitely it, it's hard to kind of recommend i think to everybody i think anybody who like really enjoys games should try it but i i mean i know people who like they don't like anime because of the like i don't know what it's called but like the fan service element yeah the fan service yeah. of it so for them i'd be like well you know here's 2b <laughs> i'd like show them a picture and be like you're gonna be looking at her butt a lot <laughs> yeah Especially if you like self destruct. Yeah, um, I learned about that far later. Somebody yeah. was like, "Oh, and here's the outfit if you blow yourself up," and I'm like, "That's a thing." <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I immediately did it, and I was like, "Oh, that's why people do it." Uh huh. Yeah. 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 See, so I like I, to them, I wouldn't really recommend it. Um, but I think like people who enjoy gaming, just blanket in general, mm -hmm. I think it's worth checking out. I mean, even now, even like it being five or six years old. I mean, it's hard now because I think the really magical moments are spoiled, right? Because, I mean, it's been sure. so long. It's just kind of in casual conversation now. But I don't know. I think there's still something magical to enjoy. It's a landmark release for this era, I would say. Um, and the other thing, too, is, like, this is a game that a lot of different types of people can resonate with. Like, if you're just into cute anime girls, we got you. If you're into big robots, we got you. If you're into, like, weird shadow organizations, like what's seen in Evangelion, like, that's an element of this. Yeah. If you like philosophy, <laughs> if <laughs> <Yep>. you like <laughs> tragedies, like plays and shit, music, yeah. like, there's so many elements that are just so meticulously crafted. And even though the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay and the actual real estate that you're exploring is fairly, like, limited in scope, it feels a lot bigger than it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I think there's really only, like... Probably six areas. Yeah. And e even some of those areas are like pretty small. Like I, I would look at like Pascal's village like that. It's tiny. And so is really the amusement park is very small as well. Mm -hmm. But it also like the way it's presented is like there's a certain like scope to it that makes it feel much larger than life. The first time you walk up those steps and the twinkling sound effect comes in oh, and you see not... the fireworks, it's incredible <laughs> yeah and that's the thing is like I, I i feel like even though this this game is older mm -hmm. i if you call it retro i'm gonna be really upset because i'm just i no good 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 i mm -hmm. listen not quite it has yeah. retro ideals in its yeah. core but no yeah god no please don't yeah this, this game it released a little bit ago it's not old it released a, a little bit ago because <laughs> don't, yeah, don't call six-year-old game old please that's the um, advantage of this show is we can talk about stuff that's not like immediately come out because me and you are tired <laughs> yes and sometimes we want to play things without the rush of a deadline <laughs> yeah and and that is it, it's weird because over the last few weeks near mm -hmm. almost became like my comfort food my comfort mm -hmm. game where i just be like okay you know i have like I have like half an hour. I'm kind of tired. All right, I'll yeah. just like pop in and kill a moose yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Destroy some robots and look cool while I'm doing it. And mm -hmm. that's it. And, you know, I, it's moment to moment gameplay is, I think it's, while it didn't like resonate with me specifically, the hacking part, I think it's incredibly smooth. Yeah. I, 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 and it's weird because I've never really enjoyed like the action 
like Bayonetta Devil May Cry. Yeah, like the character action, like DMC Bayonetta games that much. Like, I'm not a huge fan of those games just because I suck. Mm -hmm. Yep. Take some skill. (laughs) Yeah. But, and that's what the auto chips are for. (laughs) Like, it's, Mm -hmm. I don't know, this game makes itself approachable in a way that those other character action games don't. Yeah. And it it still leaves things vague enough that you're like, I wonder what happens if. Yes. And then you start, like, poking at things. Yes. Like, did I know when I caught a fish and I ate it, that would be an ending? No. That was my first 20 minutes of playing, Justin. (laughs) Um, I didn't know. I was like, cool. Credits rolled. And I'm like, this is a special thing. (laughs) For me, it was like I was equipping and unequipping uh, the OS. Or not the OS. Uh But I got there. (laughs) But the chips. And I was like, huh, (laughs) OS. I wonder what happens if I take that in. And then just credits. I was like, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Boom. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, man. A lot of this kind of like funny element is referenced in the anime and the ending credits. So I actually recommend if you're going to watch anime, watch the like little puppet scenes too, because they reference all these like little things. And sometimes they just tell you lore that you wouldn't know otherwise. Like, I didn't know the androids had a system in them to where they could process water. That's one of their main like energy sources, is just oh, drink yeah, a I cup did. of water every now and again. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> their blindfolds are not blindfolds, they're like heads up displays. Okay, see, I had a question about that because mm-hmm. my wife was like, so can they see or can they not see? Like, what's the deal? And I was like, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> I just assume that they have it on because it looks They can see more cool. than you think. Yeah, really? Is that But it's a philosophical in- piece. It's a metaphor thing, right? Because Yorha blinds their soldiers because they don't want them to know, know the truth, even though the blindfold itself is a unit of truth where you get data and stuff, right? Like, it's, huh. it's layers. <laughs> Damn, yeah. Okay, this game is a little... I mean, I knew this game was deep, but, like... This is some of the stuff I, like, found out while reading and watching the, the adaptation. See, I might have I might have to actually start digging into that, because, see, you say this, and then I'm like, yeah, I played the game and I had fun, but, like, it's these those, like, types of aha moments that I'm like, mm-hmm. man, you know what? Maybe I do... Maybe I do sit down and watch, like, the 10-hour lore deep dive of, yep. like... Like, yeah. give me the Tim Rogers equivalent or the Hazel video where they just go off for three to four hours. So I have a question. Um, sure. So obviously, like, the A units are, like, attack units, I believe, is what they're called. Something, Something they like that, yeah. Or, uh, yeah, the A units are, like, attack or assist units. The B They are, like, establish the all units. this stuff, but, like, three of them matter. <laughs> yeah, and I know, like, S is, I believe it's, like, scout or survey. Scout, yeah. Scout. What is E? Do you know? (laughs) So here's why I didn't finish reading this short story book. The first one is cool, philosophical, has great imagery. It's Prometheus, whatever. That's awesome. Then it gets into a squadron of androids coming down and meeting up with the resistance years prior to when 2B hits it. So it's like A2 and her goons, right? Okay. And so the goons all are named like, and it's not even A2. She has like a different call sign or whatever. And so they're all call signs. And I'm like, who's who? Because they don't, like, explain right, what they go. look like because they're all Yora units. <laughs> um, what is a uh, E unit in here? But that's, I like, I've, and it's the longest short story in the book, too. And it's the most uninteresting thing in the world because it's all <laughs> military jargon speak. And it's just like, God, can we get on with it? <laughs> like, <laughs> And yeah, see, that's. Oh, I don't yeah. recommend that part of near. It's. I mean, I, if you're into it, go for it. Like, there's people who love that crunchy military side. The Front Mission games is a thing that people like for that reason. Uh, people like Full Metal Panic in parts because of that, which I got got. I thought Metal Full Metal Panic was entirely a mecha show. It's mostly a rom-com for the first, like, 15 oh, or 16 episodes, which weird. I'm more interested in than the military shit now so anytime like robots are on screen i'm like nah, i don't care i'm looking for <laughs> dumb poorly written romance scenes at this point <laughs> so I, I do have an update i do have an update okay, okay. so e <laughs> okay so i I'm, I'm just gonna go through them all a is attack uh b is battler d is defender e is executioner Ooh. uh g is gunner h is healer o is operator and s is scanner interesting do we meet an executioner character um i believe at the very end it is portrayed to us that 2b is actually an e unit right which is why i was curious because i was like what the hell's an e unit i I haven't heard of one. there's a whole thing going on where like two because when the androids die and the yorha unit is not destroyed because that's a plot line 
uh, their consciousness gets uploaded to the moon, and then they just yes. print a new body, basically. Yeah. And so there's this element of cycles that runs through the game, which is a very common thing in storytelling right now. Um, but 9S and 2B always end up either dying or killing each other. Yes. And so 9S is kind of like deeply psychologically messed up because of that. Yeah, and I think that's, I think it's like, it's explained, I believe A2 might be the one who explained it, or it might be 9S's like pod. One mm -hmm. of them says like, oh yeah, she's like secretly, 2B is not, not actually like a B unit, she's an E unit. And then it kind of flashes all the times that she killed him. Right, because he's faulty. Yes. He's, he has the bad emotions because the androids, even though they don't evolve, their like psyche steadily evolves. Man, there's a, there's just so, there's a lot in this. There's game. so much. <laughs> like and it's interesting because part of me like I wish we lived in a world where like near Automata did amazing. Let's just leave it. Let's we don't need to touch it anymore. But unfortunately, we don't live in that world. We we will. You are right. We will get another near, and I hope mm -hmm. the same uh, amount of love and care is put into it, and it doesn't turn into like a a machine that they're just trying to like churn these things out. Yeah, I hope it doesn't suffer from the idea of it being franchised because it is a like every release from this development group is like special, and they try to do something different with every one of them. Like even the mobile yeah. release, regardless of it being a gasha mess, like. There's some interesting storylines in that, and I it's presented beautifully. I might have to check that out. There might be a way to just play through the story at this point. I don't know. I, I got caught up in the battles and was like, I don't like this part. <laughs> so I, I just ignored that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Didn't play much more of it, but it it wouldn't surprise me if they took the Nier mobile game and ported it to modern consoles and just streamlined the whole thing. Okay. I, ho I Again, I, I do hope... We'll see now. I'm, I'm of two, mi two minds. I do hope we get another one that has you know, mm -hmm. like love and there's a lot of like craftsmanship involved in it. But I, a part of me is also worried because, well, I guess Square Enix is only the publisher. They're not true. I, do, I don't believe they have like a hand in it. Right. Mm, um, maybe either way, it's part of their publishing portfolio. Okay. Yeah. Cause square things tend to take a long time <laughs> and sometimes unfortunately more than not end up mediocre. Not as good as they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's just hope Nier doesn't go down that that uh, path. I think that we're kind of seeing the franchising element, especially because of the anime adaptation. But I think that's ultimately going to help it, especially if they continue to make Nier Automata just available. Yeah. Which I appreciate. I wouldn't be surprised if they remade the Dragon Guard games at this point rather than make a new Nier. Mm. Dragon Guard games. Well, see, because they, they're very much in line with, like, uh, what's that style of game? Miso? Oh, Muso. Mm -hmm. Muso, yeah. Like they're very much warriors and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's very much in like the same style of gameplay. Mm -hmm. It's like the, you know the like one versus. So style, imagine like you take the general scenario and characters and some of the cutscenes and stuff of Dragon Guard and just modernize it like they did for Near Replicant. I think it could work. Oh, absolutely, because I I do think that there's like a lot presentationally that mm -hmm. even now I'm I like to go back and watch old cutscenes of things oh like god i time. do too the black okay. waltz scene in final fantasy 9 is like peak oh it's amazing. storytelling <laughs> visuals yeah. to me like it's it, so oh, yeah. cool um th that's actually why in g4 they had like this show one time where it was just like all they would do is like show cutscenes for like half an hour it's my favorite mm -hmm. that was my favorite show um but dragon guard is one of those games that every once in a while i'll go back and i'll just i'll just watch the opening oh man i really wish i could go back to like whatever it was like 2000 and whatever Mm -hmm. and just like play through this again because god what a fun time um but i think you i do think Steam like a lot. Deck. oh i know that i will tell you right now that thing <laughs> is like an emulation machine uh, i know that's why i want one specifically yeah. for ps2 games yeah oh man what am i playing right now um ps2 wise what do i have on there i, I it's charging right now or else i'd look at it but it's not sure. even in the same room but yeah i know it's <laughs> just it, i've <laughs> I have a very large memory card filled up with like a hundred PS2 games. Uh, mostly As RPGs. you should. Yeah. Mostly RPGs, Damn it. but yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. That's something if, if this, for whatever reason, if this particular side of the, of the forever classic podcast series gets more popular than our other thing, anybody that knows me knows I'm a staunch defender of emulation and yeah. preservation in general. So, I mean, if you are in the position where you're like, 
man, I wish I could go back and play Dragon Guard and get the full context of everything and play the games chronologically as they came out. Go for it. Like, the way to do it is PS2 because I don't think any of the Dragon Guard games are, like, available in a modern sense. No. Well. Because the PS3 one wasn't ported either. No, I'd have to look into, like, I don't really keep up with, like, the PS Plus stuff. Mm. I don't. I used to, but now I just, like, I don't have time for it anymore, so I don't even look at it. I don't, half the time I don't even claim my monthly games. So I'm, I'm sure it's there somewhere, but I don't know, because they're really weird about how they're adding, like, all these classic games. Like, mm-hmm. randomly, out of nowhere, they added Legend of Dragoon, and um, there's another game they added, to Wild Arms 2, I think. Yeah, just, like, out of the blue. Yep, no rhyme or reason. Not very well either. Like the LOD port had some issues and that a lot of it's since been fixed. Like there were core, like you throw your magic attack as a dragoon and it would like soft lock the game or some shit. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. But that's been fixed. <laughs> so I, I keep up with uh, just the general, like a lot of my people on my Twitter feed are all retro nuts like me. So if something happens, I'll probably see it. Um, things like remakes fascinate me. When you port yeah. a thing, when there's a ROM hack that's really cool. I love that type of stuff. So um, I did hear the uh, when the blog post came out, it was like the shot heard around the world for yes. my Twitter feed. Oh, because most of my friends are super anybody's into Twitter LED. feed because it's all anybody was talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a game. I it's it ties as number one for me. Okay, from a personal level with Final Fantasy IX, I will admit. LOD Legend of Dragoon is the worst game on my top ten list by far. As far as boil it down. As a video game. Man, I don't even know what would be on my top 10 list other than Final Fantasy IX. <laughs> this is why we're friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. Oh, man, I, I should have worn my Final Fantasy IX shirt. I was wearing this shirt because I was my interview that I had earlier. And then I yeah, know that right they liked. On. This is a, um, a Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Oh, fantastic. I've yes, got I'll... just a classic Shenron from DBZ. Oh, nice, nice, yeah. Yeah, I have like <laughs> the, uh, the one of the Black Waltzes just like... It's just like a really like cool. I don't know. I really like. I love Final Fantasy IX like artwork on like shirts. Yep. It's just like a stylized version of him like looking. Yeah. You can't see it from this angle, but right there is uh, the entire cast of Nine as Moogles, and along this top shelf is pretty much the entire cast in the like Bring Arts figure format. Oh god. Yeah. I'm missing two. <laughs> I'm missing Freya and Beatrix, and I'll buy them for myself eventually. But they. I think all of them actually were gifts from my friend Izzy, who also does a podcast. Um, I don't remember what her show is called. It's like Nerdy Ladies with Opinions, and I think she has another one too. So go check out Izzy. She's a good friend of ours, Uh, which I guess that kind of leads to the end of this episode. Uh, Let's talk about where people can find our stuff. So, Justin, if people wanted to find you... Oh, no, wait, we need to, before we even do that, let's backtrack here. Uh, so this is a, a game study podcast. Yes. We would love it if people would play along. Yep. And if you have questions or thoughts, submit it to us. Uh, so the next time you listen to us, we will be playing, and we're going to sit down and try to record this on the 20th of March. We're going to play Resident Evil 2 Remake. It's it's that time of year, because yep. Resident Evil 4 is literally just around the corner for a lot of us. Uh, yep. But Resident Evil 2 Remake is a fantastic video game. I'm yes, going to be playing it for the first time in 4K this time around on the PlayStation. Last time I did it on PC, so I'm very excited to revisit it for the first time in a while. And that'll be me and Reese. And then if we want to look just a touch ahead, uh, Mega Man 2 on the NES is also on the docket. That We'll record in the first week of April. Yeah, so that's. Uh, I will be there for that one. Um, yes. I've never finished Mega Man 2, but... I love the soundtrack to that game. It's um, so good. Uh, I used to get my... I know this is completely off topic, and I'm sorry. Well, sure. Um, it's it's uh, related. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my brother had a... Man, how... It wasn't... It actually wasn't that long ago. It was maybe like 18 years ago. Uh, he bought a Nintendo collection off like this this old guy that lived on our street because his son used to play it, and he didn't play it anymore. And it came with 100 games. He bought it for $100. Wow. What a deal. Oh, yeah, the guy was just like, I don't want this in my house anymore. Yeah, just sure, whatever, man. It. So my brother went and uh, tried to, like, would start collecting games. I think he ended up with, like, I think it was, like, 300. A lot of, like, unlicensed stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, but, yeah, and then his, I won't get into it, but, yeah, <laughs> some stuff happened and he lost it. Um, no. But he, uh, Mega Man 2 was, like, one of his go-tos. And I, when he was always at work, I would, like, sit there, 
put Mega Man 2 in and I wouldn't even play it. I would just listen to the music. I think the music in that game is fantastic. It's phenomenal. It is and very representative of the NES era and it still holds up extremely well. Yes, absolutely it does. And so that's the general idea of what we're doing with the show. We're going to play some stuff that we set aside. Yep. We don't have a we don't have a big deadline. Um we are going to play Final Fantasy 9 on this podcast. Uh we're not going to record awesome. that till like the summer. <laughs> but it's something that me, you and Zach I think are going to try to sit down and talk on. Okay. We should try and talk Marcus into playing that with us. <laughs> we can get the whole ding dang clan if we I want. I think we should because I <laughs> look. Listen, I'm not gonna say here, sit here and say Final Fantasy IX is a perfect game, but it's a fir- it's, it's a perfect game. Okay, it's pretty close. <laughs> yeah, like I actually just recently have started to like my son loves Lego games, um, mm-hmm. and now he loves like uh, what is he playing right now? Super Mario Odyssey and oh, a nice. lot of like Kirby stuff. Um, and he's how old? Seven. Okay, yeah, that's about the time that Joe's daughter played Odyssey. I think. Yeah, he's Maybe like he, younger. Yeah, he's still like. He's, he's he he gets frustrated and takes like a couple days break, but he like mm-hmm. I haven't had to help him do anything, or no, I had to help him get like one star, but it actually turned out he had already gotten it. And he just like forgot. Oh, funny. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, well, it was hard for me, and I just did it, and I didn't need to do it. So you can whatever you can do the rest yourself. Um, but no, he he's he's uh, he's doing good in that. But uh, I just recently started to talk about introducing him to Final Fantasy games, mm. and I think I'm going to do how I approached it was I just said, hey, do you like because he knows, he knows I love Final Fantasy because I talk about it all the time. Um, and he knows I love Final Fantasy IX because I have like VV uh, tattooed on my back. It was like my first tattoo that I ever got. And I have like a, a mog on my shoulder, the, specifically the mog from Final like Fantasy. Like the little male that's got the pouch and everything? Well, so it's it's actually the box art for the SNES version of Final Fantasy III slash six, where it's six. like leaning on the knife. Oh, cool. Yeah. That was like my second tattoo. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, so I, th- I think I'm gonna approach it as like, th- sorry, the way I did approach it is, mm-hmm. I said, do you like fantasy or do you want like, do you want like magical like knights and wizards and magic or do you want like guns and swords? And he said, well, he wants a little bit of both. So I'm gonna start him with like, I'm just gonna do the run through. I'm just gonna do seven, eight, nine. Might skip mm-hmm. eight because eight is like a little heavy. Uh, I mean, they're all a little heavy, but I'm it's excited. also mechanically probably the most hard to figure out between yes. the three. Yeah, because I, I, I think seven is like, I mean, everybody likes seven. I'm uh, indifferent towards seven, I'll be honest, but I, mm-hmm. I understand that people like it. But I also don't want to shove nine down his throat because I want him to enjoy it as much as I do. And it's straight up Shakespeare in points. Like, depending oh, yeah. on his reading comprehension, it might be kind of tough to figure it out. Um, That is what he excels in at school. So Awesome. Yeah. He'll be fine. He'll he will learn like he'll be a better reader through playing. RPGs oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I think that would definitely be a great one to have like everyone on because I know I love Final Fantasy IX. I know you love Final Fantasy IX. I'd like to talk to somebody who doesn't. <laughs> mm, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I'm not sure how either. I'm not sure how Zach or Joe or Mar- like, I'm not Joe sure how likes it. I think okay. Zach does too. I don't know about Marcus or Reese though. That's so currently that's our our staff at uh, yeah. Forever Classic Games. It's all volunteer. Staff's not the right word for it. Um but we're steadily getting to the point where we we just had a video hit 100,000 likes. Reese is really spearheading the uh the Yeah, that was amazing by the way. Yeah, simple little video. He just he didn't even tell me he was making it. He just sent it to me one day and he's like, "Hey, can you approve this?" And I'm like, "Sure." And clicked it and then, you know, a day goes by and it has 30,000 hits. I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> He's like, I don't know, man. It seems like something people would want. And then it just kept building. Yeah. And at one point I was like, oh, it's probably going to hit 100K by the end of the week. And by the end of the workday, it had hit 100K. I was like, all right, now we need to like, we need to actually make some YouTube stuff now. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> because it might be our passive income that fuels the website. Because yeah. initially I had designed Forever Classic Games to have a PR component. But I now work for Stride PR, so we don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> conflict yeah, <that's> of interest. <laughs> uh, so uh, all of those skills, specifically, uh, my boss Rob pays for, uh, deservedly so. I love my job; it's super, super cool. And the Stride team is fantastic, and they're not paying me to say that. I genuinely like these people. <laughs> uh, but so we're we're really like we're getting into the groove of things. Like this podcast is a another thing we wanted to offer to our viewers as a different way to approach games because. We are often, we even though the whole thing is kind of structured to be games as an entirety, right? Yeah. Like, 
if we put out a review of Final Fantasy 2, that's totally fine and fits our structure, and I'm yeah. sure our readers would like it. Um, but even though that is the core nature of Forever Classic Games, we do find ourselves in the in the the cycle, right? Like right now, we have three or four reviews that probably should be done by the end of the week, and so it's it's nice to be able to take a break and be like, okay, let's play something that like has cultural significance, has like a, a good memory or connection to us that we want to share, like FF9. So generally, I'm I'm excited about Forever Classic Games as a whole. i uh, really excited about this show. And, I mean, having you as a part of it has been an extremely cool piece of it. Oh, thank you. I enjoy being a part of it. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, Forever Classic Games. Yeah, sorry, is... I'm not going to be talking about myself. So <laughs> I'm just gonna... <laughs> Justin's awesome. Y'all just look him up <laughs> on Open Critic and Dread XP and Pride. Yeah, I'm 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 kind of a little bit everywhere right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and but I, I oh go for it. Oh, I don't know if I can talk about this while we're recording. I'll tell you after. But I I took okay. a, a, a probably possibly the biggest shot I've ever taken today, so I'm excited to Ooh. hear back. But I'll tell you. About I, that I've been here. shooting shots at hardware and uh, Square Enix and Capcom people over the past week because we're even though I'm like in PR, I still you know write about some of these big folks and some yeah. of the indies that I love. And so when I have the opportunity, I'll still keep trucking on like I always have. Um, but anyways, uh, you can enjoy clutter free games and geek culture media over at foreverclassicgames.com. And that aforementioned YouTube and Twitch channel, if you just look for us, we're available. We're on Twitter at Forever X Classic because we couldn't fit the entire name. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I think we have a TikTok, maybe a Reddit. Regardless, if if you want us there, let us know and we can be there. Uh, this podcast will release or the general podcast will release every Monday. This particular show will alternate Monday. So basically, we'll go from our our study one game uh, episode structure to a more general kind of topic episode structure. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll alternate between those two. So typically every Monday you should get a forever classic episode. And also Monday is a great day for podcasts because Justin's other show also releases on Mondays. Typically it does. Yes. Uh, I believe I have it releasing. I didn't, I didn't actually, I wasn't on this week cause I was sick. <laughs> yeah. They had, uh, they had Larry's wife for cocaine yeah. bear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I still need to listen. Fun to that. I, haven't, I haven't listened to that yet. Yeah, it, it, we have, we usually, uh, I guess that's somewhere else you can find me is uh, I do, I host or co-host a uh, horror podcast. Uh, I'm very entrenched in the the horror mindset of things. Uh, it's called Here's Johnny Podcast. Sorry, I'm also still very ill. <laughs> I'm trying to make yeah, sense of my words. Um, yeah, that releases every Monday, roughly around 1230 in the morning on everything, I think. I, I think it's, I got a complaint one time that it didn't show up on a pod bean. I don't know what that is. And then I went the next week, and they're like, "Oh, it was fixed." I didn't do anything; it just kind of showed up. So I think mm -hmm. it go. I think it releases everywhere. I'm not sure. I don't understand the RSS structure nearly as much as somebody like Zach, who I think set it up initially. I pay uh, some. I, I pay a website wrong. to do it for me. I say, "Yeah, yeah take yeah. my money, put it places." <laughs> right now, I think I might be paying something I don't need to pay for. But regardless, oh. uh, if we're not on a thing, and you guys want either here's Johnny or or Forever Classic or any any of the shows that we happen to know and be friends with like let us know we'll talk to yeah. the people and get it on whatever it's on like spotify and google google podcasts those are the i think i think those ones. are like the yeah. interest those are like the ones that everybody uses or mostly everybody anyways right yeah um there for a while we were on oh shoot i can't even think of it Stitcher. now there's, there's two or three maybe i don't know uh, but, <laughs> uh, and if you wanted to reach us individually, you can find me on, on Twitter at AC McCumbers, which is, you know, a lot of C's I know, but I'm generally easy to find. You can find me on open critic with all my stuff. I've got muckrack. Uh, I'm doing PR games for the PR services for the game industry generally for, for stride. So you might see me talk about whatever game client I happen to be supporting at the time, but, uh, I'm available. And then Justin's also available on Twitter. Yes, uh, you can find me at, sorry, I have to look it up because I don't remember anymore. Uh, I'm at D underscore Justin Wood because I was at Pickle Thing, but then I decided I needed to be more professional and use my real name. But yeah, so we're, both of us are available online. We're writers. I mean, you can find us. And if you have a suggestion for this show, you can email us at contact at Forever Classic Games, or you can find us on one of these social medias or a Discord or whatever, and and just say, hey, I think you should play this thing, and here's why, and maybe we'll find some guests along the way. Uh, but generally, we're into the idea of perpetuating this Monday structure and 
doing some extra video stuff and if there's a review that you're really interested in whether it's you know something that's coming out in the next few weeks or something that came out eight years ago it doesn't matter <laughs> we can <laughs> yeah. tackle it uh we won't drop everything for a lot of things but you know we're there and then yeah. we also have a, a paypal that's readily available all of our writers on the site i believe or at least most of us have an option somewhere in their bio to tip them and it's something we highly encourage and in, in the state we are right now we're we're still trying to figure out the whole like business side of stuff um so if you like a writer's work like justin or reese or marcus or whoever uh pitch them a fiver if you feel like it and want to see more of our stuff because generally what we want to do is we want to provide ad free clutter free good writing and talk about things we like yeah i mean there's i, th I think that is how you get the I, man i'm not good with words today but like the realist writing right because it's mm -hmm. it's you have people writing about things that they are passionate about and they enjoy and they don't have to worry about like okay well i had to make sure i hit like this like seo right yeah stuff that i don't know seo i can't tell i don't know seo for the life <laughs> of me uh but yeah no i i, I think it's the, the most interesting way to get the like really good writing because you have like marcus for example who is i don't know if it's okay to talk about his destiny article but he's yeah. like a, he's obsessed with destiny right not in a bad way he, he loves destiny so he just you likes know, it yeah yeah so i like for me as an outsider who doesn't enjoy destiny i would i like to read about that stuff specifically for marcus because i know he is very invested in that mm -hmm. he's making up a, a feature guide thing that hopefully by the time this is out will be available on our website that'll help the onboarding process because jumping into any game of that scope can be tough right um, yeah that's something like near like you know watch the yeah. first episode of the anime if you're really curious and if you like it you probably will like the game yeah but yeah so this was this was a fun time justin i'm glad we got to sit down and do this i'm glad we've got the the general idea in the air and let's let's do some more of these, man. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I, so I obviously won't be here for Resident Evil 2. I have a... Uh, mm, yeah, I won't be here. <laughs> plans. Yes, I have plans. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, Justin has plans. <laughs> I, that's, that's That should just be my name. Justin has plans. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, but I am excited to come back for uh, Mega Man 2 because even though that's a game that I've never played, it's a game that I've always wanted to play. It's going to be interesting, though, because I suck at platforming. <laughs> if you're going to play one, that's it's the easiest Mega Man. Some of really? them are okay. annoying. <laughs> that's okay. That's what the rewind function in an emulator is for. <laughs> uh, when you're studying that, by the way, I highly recommend the Mega Man Maker software, which okay. is basically Mario Maker, but it's a NES Mega Man system. It's exceptionally well made and still like supported and developed. I'm pretty really? certain. Mm -hmm. I was because I know like they had that uh, Zelda maker that got like taken down very quickly. Yeah, uh, the randomizer is still okay though. I think the one oh that yeah, they they were were the randomizer is good. Actually, I I was I managed to install randomize uh, Zelda games on, on my Steam Deck. So hell yeah, yeah. I'll send you a link to the uh, the Mega Man Discord. It's easy to find. Okay, but um yeah, so that that does it for for this first outing, and we hope you all enjoyed. Let us know, um but stay cool and, and play some games guys because that's what we're gonna do 